All right, good morning. We're going to go ahead and get started. Um, I understand there's not much parking out there, but maybe that's the problem, maybe not. But we're going to punish those of you who are here early. I can always tell the visitors they always come early, and our regulars always come late. So thank God for both, I guess. But um, for those of you that are visiting, we're a church that meets uh, 12 months out of the year. Six months we meet on the beach and uh, six months we meet in the Christian Conference Center, which is in the heart of town, just to the right of the totem pole if you're facing away from the beach. There's an octagonal building that's part of that compound there, and we rent that building. And uh, we'd love to see those of you that come back that have properties here or whatever, and maybe you come back during the winter time to winterize or whatever. We'd love to see you come back and visit us then. Um, after, um, I have some questions about our times Service times after um, the end of this month, we will switch to uh, nine o'clock. So um, we're gonna continue to meet at eight o'clock un until the lifeguards are, are done. And I think they will stay through the end of, um, at least some lifeguards will stay through the end of uh, September. So we kind of wanna work around that. We really don't try to be a, uh, you know, in your face kind of ministry here at church. We, we, we purposely came down here on this end of the beach rather than out front the boardwalk and we try to accommodate the crowds that come on the beach. So uh, our goal is to just be able to worship the Lord this morning and uh, do so with as minimal, minimal interference as possible. Uh, but we're thankful that you have decided to join us. Uh, there's a few announcements I just want to get out of the way. Uh, of course, every Wednesday night we have our Wednesday night Bible study. We call it Bonfire Bible Study. And uh, we're, we actually do that at my house on the back table there in front of the offering box are our cards. Take several of those cards, pass them out to your friends, but also um, buy at home addresses there that you can GPS and, uh, and come to our Bible study if you haven't come. We meet at seven o'clock and we study through the Bible. We also have a time of prayer and fellowship but right now we're going through the Psalms. And so I think it's a pretty interesting study. I would encourage you to be a part of that on Wednesday night at seven o'clock. Also coming up this week, um, every month we have our um, women's prayer walk and they'll be meeting this Saturday, which is the 10th in the parking lot at nine o'clock and uh, for a time of prayer and they walk around the town or up and down the boardwalk. Sometimes they change around. I'm not sure exactly where they go, but. They walk and pray together, and uh, if you'd like to be a part of that, um, you can just meet them there at 9 o'clock. Um, if you have questions, you can ask my wife Susie back there, um, and uh, she can set you straight. She sets me straight all the time. And then um, on that same morning, Saturday, at 8 o'clock, the men are meeting for their monthly prayer breakfast. And uh, we do that at um, Bethany Diner, and we do that at 8 o'clock. So we would encourage you to be a part of that this Wednesday, I mean this, uh, this Saturday the 10th. All right, that's all the announcements. Uh, we'll begin our service this morning with a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for your presence with us this morning. We thank you for the beautiful weather that we've, you've given us. We do not take that for granted. We thank you that... God does not dwell in temples made with hands, but he is near us in our hearts, in the word of God. As we study together, as we fellowship together, he is here in our midst. So Lord, we thank you for Jesus Christ, for his sacrifice for us, for the fact that we are brothers and sisters in Christ. We ask that you would bless this time of worship. God said that Jesus said that God is spirit and they that worship him must worship him in spirit and in truth. So Lord, help us to worship you in truth this morning, to have fellowship in the truth as we study your word and worship you this morning. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. All right, well, let's start off with a couple of songs this morning. We'll start by singing, How Great Thou Art.
Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the world I hands have made. I see the star, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power the universe is playing. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me. How great thou art, how great thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to how great thou art, how great thou art. And when I think that God is Son, not sparing, send him to die, I cares can take it in that on the I heard on glad he buried, he bled and died to take away my sin. Then sings my soul, my Savior God to me, how great thou art. How great thou art, how great thou art, when Christ shall come, we shout of acclamation, and take me home, what joy shall fill my heart, then I shall bow. Humble adoration and their proclaim, my God, I praise thou art. Then sings my soul, my Savior God, to me. How great thou art! How great thou art! Flip over to um, can't remember how firm a foundation.
As I said on Wednesday night, we're studying the Psalms. It's our practice to read a Psalm every Sunday morning. And I thought uh, I'd have Rusty give you a little preview. We're going to read Psalm 5 today, if you'd like to follow along. That's the Psalm we'll be studying this week at our Bible study. Rusty? Well, good morning, church. Psalm 5, if you're going to follow along, and uh, as you can see when I pull the microphone down, when we're in the water, they refer to the pastor as longboard. They refer to me as shortboard. <laughs> Psalm 5. Give ear to my words, O Lord. Consider my groaning. Heed the sound of my cry for help, my King and my God, for to thee do I pray. In the morning, O Lord, thou will hear my voice. In the morning, I will order my prayer to thee and eagerly watch. For thou art not a God who takes pleasure in the wickedness. No evil dwells in thee. The boastful shall not stand before thine eyes. Thou dost hate all who do iniquity. Thou dost destroy those who speak falsehoods. The Lord abhors the man of bloodshed and deceit. But as for me, by thine abundant loving kindness, I will enter thy house. At thy holy temple, I will bow in reverence for thee. O Lord, lead me in thy righteousness because of my foes. Make thy way straight before me. There is nothing reliable in what they say. Their inward part is destruction itself. Their throat is an open grave. They flatter with their tongues. Hold them guilty, O God. By their own devices, let them fall. In the multitude of their transgressions, thrust them out, for they are rebellious against thee. But let all who take refuge in thee be glad. Let them ever sing for joy. And mayest thou shelter them 
that those who love thy loving name may exalt in thee. For it is thou who dost bless the righteous man, O Lord. Thou dost surround him with favor as with a shield. I looked around and I anticipated today that there would be parents here, children, students, teachers, and school administrators. So I brought you a prayer and I need your help at the end just for a response, at which time I'll say all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Heavenly Father, grant us comfort, fellowship, peace, and safety in this place. Be in our midst. Sharpen our hearing and our understanding of your word in Pastor Roy's message today. Also, we ask that you be in our midst at our Fellowship Saturday activities coming up. When the enemy challenges your word, let us respond in faith, in its authority, and in its trustworthiness. Bless and be with the parents, the children, their teachers, and the administrative staff as they begin this school year. Some are newly started, some are yet to begin. I recall 60 years ago, school-sponsored prayer was removed from U.S. schools. I remember vividly the next day when my teacher told us we would not be saying a prayer this morning. Father, I repent of my compliance with God's, my non-compliance with the world's ordinances and for disregarding your ordinances. Still. We pray for godly leadership in our schools and in universities. For even there, we are called to pray continually with thanksgiving and for God's purposes. And we are to have bold faith in God's word and that we should have both our faith and his word written in receptive, committed, and devoted hearts. Even in schools and universities, we know that if we draw near to Jesus, he will draw near to us. And even there, where two or three are gathered together in Jesus' name, he will be in our midst. We ask forgiveness for our compliance with worldly rules. We ask forgiveness for our failures and for yielding the field. We repent and confess that Jesus Christ is Lord. Grant us strength and grace as our bodies grow in age. Grant us stronger faith as our wisdom, knowledge, and understanding increase. Grant us receptive, committed, and devoted hearts. And all God's people said, Turn in your Bibles this morning to 2 Timothy chapter 2. It's our practice to preach through the Bible verse by verse, chapter by chapter. And uh, so we are here today in a continuing study of 2 Timothy. And we're going to pick up where we left off last week. In the essence of time, I'm not going to read the whole passage first. I'm just going to read it as I go through. And uh, my goal is to try to get you out of here by 9 o'clock. So <clears throat> if I read it, I may not make it. In the previous section, which we looked at last week, Paul said in his admonition to Timothy that he was to be like a strong warrior, that he should not be afraid of making the ultimate sacrifice for the sake of the gospel. As a warrior for the kingdom of God, he should not shrink back from affliction, persecution, or even death because of the eternal glory that awaited him. Today, in this next passage, Paul changes analogy, saying that Timothy needed to be a workman that was not ashamed. And then he uses yet another analogy. He was to be a useful vessel as opposed to a worthless vessel. 
Now, Paul's writing to Timothy, who was sort of like an assistant to the apostle. He was actually working as an emissary of the apostle while Paul was in prison. And Timothy was then to teach these principles to the local pastors in Ephesus and the surrounding region. But though it's written to pastors, it is by extension given as well to the congregation. You're not excluded from this message because he wrote it to pastors, because whatever standard the Lord sets for the pastor is given so that the pastors can then be an example to the flock. Paul said to Timothy, be an example to the believers in word and conduct. The Apostle Paul said about himself that you are to follow me as I follow Christ. And so what's true for the pastor is also true for the congregation. It should be an example for all of us to follow. In this passage, Paul talks about a workman that does not need to be ashamed. That's in contrast to other church leaders who he names throughout this epistle, but here in this passage he names Hymenaeus and Philetus, who will be ashamed when they face the judgment. And notice in verse 14, you see the word useless. And in verse 24, 21, rather, you see the word useful. There's a contrast there in this text about being useless or being useful. A good, faithful workman or a shameful workman. Anyone who serves the Lord, I would hope, would desire to be useful. A workman that doesn't need to be ashamed. What does it mean then to be useful? Verse 21 says, Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. The word vessel there is a word indicating a household container. It refers to a pot or a cup or a serving dish or a serving bowl. And the master of the house had certain vessels that were honorable. On the other hand, there are other vessels. They are dishonorable. Verse 20 says, in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware, some to honor and some to dishonor. I think Paul is giving a picture here of the church. And the master in this large house, which is the church, is none other than the Lord Jesus Christ. And within the church, there are contrasting vessels that are given for service to the congregation. Some of them are honorable. They are made of precious metals. They're clean. They're useful. They're sanctified for every good purpose. There are others that would never be for proper food service. They're not for any clean uses. They're, they're dishonorable. They're made of wood and earthenware and pottery. The contrast presented there is deliberately a, an extreme contrast. The honorable vessels in the house were those which you served food on. And the dishonorable vessels were what you took out the waste in. So what does it mean then to be a useful vessel? What is it to be a, a gold or silver serving dish? To serve people the bread of life. Well, if you go back to verse 21, it says there are three things that describe the useful vessel. First of all, it is sanctified. Secondly, the master employs it for his good purposes. And thirdly, it is prepared for good works. Now let's go back to verse 20 and look at the analogy. He says, a large house. This pictures the church. There are valuable, honorable vessels that are used to serve the food. But there's also the vessels which have become corrupted and are only good for common use. That this house is the church we can draw from verse 19, which says, Nevertheless, the firm foundation of God stands. Most commentators think that that phrase, the firm foundation of God, is a, is a reference to the church. Because in 1 Timothy 3.15, the church is called by Paul the filler, pillar and foundation of the truth. 
So Paul gives here seven characteristics of an honorable vessel, of an unashamed workman. And this is what we would all desire to be. We should all desire to be a vessel for honor, which is useful to the Lord. So seven characteristics are given here. Now, the first one's going to take a bit long, bit bit of time to go through. So don't get all worked up when you think, well, we got seven more to go because the rest will go pretty quickly after that. But number one, the number one thing that is necessary to be an unashamed workman or an honorable vessel is biblical fidelity, biblical fidelity. Look in verse 14, remind them of these things. These things are the things concerning the gospel of Jesus Christ and solemnly charge them in the presence of God. Solemnly charge them in the presence of God. Now he's speaking to pastors. That's to say they have an accountability to God. They are visible to God. God is watching. God is listening. You know, it should be a sobering thing to realize God is watching. you. And what is the charge he gives? Well, in, in, in chapter 4, verse 2, he states that charge to pastors in a positive sense, which is to preach the word of God the truth of God, to preach the truth of God. Now, Paul charges them in the negative sense here. He says, not to wrangle about words, which is useless and leads to the ruin of the hearers. The word ruin there, by the way, is the Greek word catastrophe. That's where we get the word catastrophic from. It means it's devastating, it's destructive. So what is he talking about when he says wrangling about words? Well, to wrangle is to wrestle. It's an argument made on the strength of human wisdom, philosophy, human reason, from the viewpoint of the world. The argument of the church, which uses the reason of the world, has an outcome which is catastrophic. In contrast to that, Paul says you should accurately handle the word of truth. Verse 15 says, be diligent to present yourself approved to God as a workman who does not need to be ashamed, accurately handling the word of truth. Forget about trying to wrangle, make an argument with words of human wisdom. Instead, accurately handle the word of truth. Paul says there to be diligent. That's spadazzo in the Greek, I think is how you pronounce it. I'm probably wrong. Ask Nick later, he'll tell you. But it means to give maximum effort. In the King James Version, which I actually prefer, it says, study to show yourself approved. Now, that may not be the best translation, but I do think it's applicable because if you're going to handle accurately the Word of God, you must be careful to study the Word, to compare Scripture with Scripture, to meditate on the Word. We are instructed in the Scriptures repeatedly to meditate on the word paul said back in verse 7 he says consider think about what i say for the lord will give you understanding in everything think on the word meditate on it so that we may interpret it and apply it correctly the idea presented here is not just to be a student of the word but to apply what you have learned and become an expert in it it's a picture of a master workman who has perfected his craft be diligent to present yourself approved unto God as a workman that doesn't need to be ashamed. Be diligent to perfect your workmanship. What's the work? It's handling the word of God. It's accurately handling the word of truth. For the pastor especially, his craft should be expounding the word of God. It's understanding correctly what the Holy Spirit is indicating in the word. You know, the idea that some pastors seem to have is that they, they actually can improve upon the Word. Really, that must be what they think because they hardly use the Word at all. Or at, they, or at best, they use it as a springboard by which they catapult off into some rabbit trail of their own making. But the Word of God is what is powerful. The truth of God's Word is what is able to pierce the heart. Hebrews 4.12 says, For the word of God is living and active 
and sharper than any two-edged sword, and piercing as far as the division of soul and spirit, of both joints and marrow, and able to judge the thoughts and intentions of the heart. You know, to borrow a phrase from Shakespeare, man's words, man's wrangling about words, are much ado about nothing. But the word of God is able to convict, to cleanse, and to give the knowledge that leads to salvation. And so the pastor should be diligent in his study and faithful in his use of the word of God if he is to be effective and approved by God. You know, my goal is not to win your approval. My goal is not to win your approval with my witticisms and articulation and oratory skill. I used to try to tell a joke now and then because I have a kind of sour looking demeanor and people, you know, get the wrong idea that I'm not quite as jovial as I really am. And a lady in this church came up to me afterwards one day and said, Roy, don't try to tell jokes. You are not funny. You are not funny. <clears throat> so I took her word for it and I quit trying to be an entertainer. I realize that it's beyond my ability, but I also realize that it's not a worthwhile goal. My goal is to win the approval of the Lord God as a faithful messenger of what he has already said in his word. That's why we sang that song. How firm a foundation, ye saints of the Lord, is laid for your faith in his excellent word. What more can he say than to you he has said? What more can I add to that? I really shouldn't waste time trying to improve upon the word of God, but faithfully make my message what God has already said in his word. And so Paul repeats that idea again in verse 16 because maybe we didn't need maybe we need to hear it again. He says, "But avoid worldly and empty chatter, for it leads to further ungodliness." And that kind of talk spreads like gangrene. Worldly wisdom, twisting doctrine that so that it's acceptable to the world, using philosophy to try to minister instead of the truth of God, only leads to further ungodliness. That kind of talk, that kind of sermon doesn't produce sanctification. It doesn't produce more Christ-likeness in the hearer. It produces more worldliness. Worldliness, I know that's an old-fashioned term, but worldliness is the opposite of godliness. If you preach philosophy, the reasoning of the world, then don't be surprised to find that it produces more worldliness. It cannot produce godliness. You must teach the word of God if you expect the outcome to be godliness. If you teach the world's doctrines, the, then ungodliness, Paul says, spreads like gangrene. In other words, it corrupts more and more until it destroys the whole body. Paul then gives a human illustration of this type of worldly preaching. He says, among them are Hymenius and Philetus. These were two pastors who had turned from faithfully preaching the word and had developed instead a dialogue with the world. They had bought into the lies of Satan. They went so far astray from the truth that they were saying even that the resurrection had already taken place. And Paul said they upset the faith of some. We're not sure exactly what all their false doctrine entailed, but it was probably some spiritualization of the resurrection, no longer believing in a bodily resurrection. The result, though, of their false teaching was catastrophic. It upset, or a better translation is it overthrew or destroyed the faith of some in the church. That kind of false wisdom should be the opposite of true ministers of Christ. Verse 19 says, nevertheless, for firm foundation of God stands having the seal. The Lord knows those who are his. And everyone who names the name of the Lord is to abstain from wilderness, w wickedness. So the firm foundation we've already said is the church. And God says, and Paul says, God knows those who are truly his church because they abstain from wickedness. The idea Paul is speaking of there is actually borrowed from number 16. I don't have time to turn to it, but I would encourage you as your homework 
to maybe read the story in, in number 16, which is about Kor's rebellion and God's judgment. Back in number 16, the ju judgment of God fell upon those men who had rebelled against Moses' leadership. And God's judgment will once again fall on those who rebel against his word. Because God knows those who are his true, faithful workmen. God knows his true and faithful ministers because they are faithful to the word. And it's evident because they abstain from wickedness. You know, good behavior is always the product of a good theology. But wickedness is the product of worldly theology, philosophy rather, masquerading as theology. So the call to be a vessel unto honor, useful to the master, prepared for every good work, a workman that is unashamed is in a call to biblical truth, biblical fidelity. And right alongside that, number two, it's a call to pure fellowship. Verse 21, therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from these, he will be a vessel for honor, sanctified, useful to the master, prepared for every good work. The things he should clean, cleanse himself from are the dishonorable things, the common things, the unholy things, the world's philosophy, the carnal knowledge that spreads like gangrene and causes men of faith and women of faith to be destroyed. In the rebellion of Korah, the Lord told the Israelites to separate themselves from the wicked, lest they too be destroyed. Look back at verse 20. It says, now in a large house, there are not only gold and silver vessels, but also vessels of wood and earthenware. Some to honor and some to dishonor. So then there is pure fellowship, which is honorable, godly, and useful for every good work. And there's dishonorable fellowship, which is hallmarked by ungodliness and false doctrine. And they are both found in the church at large. And if Jesus gave us a parable about a mustard bush, which is often misinterpreted in my opinion. In Matthew 13, 31, it says, Jesus presented another parable to them saying, the kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed, which a man took and sowed in his field. And this is smaller than all other seeds. But when it is full grown, it is larger than the garden plants and becomes a tree so that the birds of the air come and nest in its branches. The problem, I think, with most interpretations, they, they confuse two different sayings about a mustard seed. And one, Jesus compares the size of, of a mustard seed to the, to the need of faith. But in this case, Jesus teaches that this mustard seed grows into something abnormal. It should produce a bush. But instead, it produces a tree, he says, which is bigger than all the other plants. And so big that the birds come and nest in its branches. If you look at another parable, which I'm sure you're all familiar with, which is the parable of the sower, Jesus explained that the birds of the air were the devils and his angels. So if we're to understand this correctly, it would seem that Jesus was saying that the church universal was going to grow. But the growth was going to be abnormally large and would actually give refuge to the devil and his angels, which are ministers of false doctrine. Do you not understand that the devil is in the church? Do you not understand that the devil dresses and goes about as an as a, uh, angel of light? And that he's in the church? If you don't recognize that, then you need to wake up. Because the devil is in the church. The fox is in the hen house. And he's masquerading in many cases as an angel of light. And as a result, the doctrines of devils and demons have taken the place of the truth of God's word. I think that ties in with what Paul is saying here. In a large house, in God's church, there are honorable and dishonorable vessels. The dishonorable vessels are those pastors or those teachers that have adulterated or even abandoned the truth of God's word for the sake of the world's acceptance and approval. 
but they are not approved by God. Some of you folks perhaps visiting today are attending churches back home that have abandoned the truth of God's word. Pastors teaching an adulterated version of the gospel, which has been sanctified by the culture of the world rather than sanctified by the word of God. I would suggest you do not know what spirit you are partaking of. I would suggest that unless you want to become corrupted like them and be cut off, that you leave those churches, stop supporting those churches for the sake of fellowship with the world and find a church where you can have pure fellowship in the truth. The third thing Paul says is this. If you want to be a useful vessel, if you want to be an honorable vessel, you not only have to have biblical fidelity and pure fellowship, but thirdly, a clean heart. Verse 22, he says, now flee from youthful lust. That's the negative. But the positive, he says, is pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. You know, youthful lust are not the sole propriety or property rather of the youth. Old people can have youthful lust as well. Older people are just people that didn't learn the lessons they should have learned in their youth. And you know, lust include all the things of this world that are in opposition to the truth of God. The desire for physical gratification or sexual gratification or financial gratification that the devil tells you can be found outside of the bounds that God has established for them. You know, God gave us physical intimacy and in sex. He gives men the ability to make money. He blesses the work of our hands. He gives us the things which we can enjoy. He supplies the needs that we have. But to lust is to want more than what God has given and use ungodly means to get such things. Paul says, run away from such things. The lusts of, these world, of this world is, are so destructive, we should run away from them the way Joseph ran away from Potiphar's wife. Don't dare to try to have God and have the world as well. Run away from the lust of the flesh and the lust of the world. But if we run away from those, there are also things we should be running to. And we should run to righteousness, faith, love, and peace. If we pursue these things, we will have a pure heart, a clean heart. He says we should pursue righteousness. That means doing right according to God's standards. Righteousness means living in harmony with God's law, living in obedience to his word. The second thing we pursue is faith. Faith is trusting that God's way is best. You know, the devil's going to tell you, nah, man, you're missing out. You're missing out on life. I can tell you how you can really have life and have it more abundantly. And he's going to give you the life that leads to destruction. But faith is trusting that God's way is best. It's being faithful to God. It's being a faithful steward of what God has trust entrusted you with. The third thing to pursue was love, a sacrificial love for others. Love is not an emotion. Here, 1 Corinthians 13 gives a definition of love. See if you can pick out the word emotion in here or feeling. It says love is patient, love is kind, and is not jealous. Love does not brag and is not arrogant, does not act unbecomingly. It does not seek its own. It is not provoked, does not take into account a wrong suffered, does not rejoice in unrighteousness, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never fails. That's agape love. That's the biblical definition of love. And then he says, pursue peace. And peace means that they've made peace with God and peace with men. They are no longer rebellious, no longer enemies of God. And notice what he says at the end of verse, end of that verse. He says, with all those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. That's speaking of salvation. To call upon the Lord is to call upon him for forgiveness, for life, for mercy, for grace, for his spirit. David called upon the Lord in Psalm 51. He says, 
Hide your face from my sin and blot out my iniquities. Create in me a clean heart, O God, and renew a steadfast spirit within me. Do not cast me away from your presence and do not take your Holy Spirit from me. Those who have called on the Lord pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. Number four, if you would be an unashamed workman, a vessel fit for the master's use, you must have a discerning mind. And here he comes right back to the same issue again, verse 23, refuse foolish and ignorant speculations, knowing that they produce quarrels. Foolish and ignorant speculations is a description of the wisdom of the world. 1 Corinthians 1.21 says, For since in the wisdom of God, the world to its wisdom did not come to know God, God was well pleased through the foolishness of the message preached to save those who believe. Because the foolishness of God is wiser than men, and the weakness of God is stronger than men. The foolish and ignorant speculations of false teaching and worldly wisdom cannot produce godliness or a pure heart, but it produces quarreling, squabbling, an impure heart, a deceived mind. You know, discernment is a gift of the Holy Spirit. That is the job of the Holy Spirit, to give us discernment, to distinguish between truth and error. You know, it said of the Bereans that they studied the Word daily to see if these things were so. The Holy Spirit was giving them insight and understanding that they might know the truth. So we should pray for discernment that we might not be deceived as we study the word and fellowship in the church. Number five, if you want to be a useful vessel, honorable, you must be characterized by a manner that is not combative or argumentative. Verse 24 says, The Lord's bondservant must not be quarrelsome, but be kind to all, able to teach, patient with wrong. Foolish and ignorant speculations produce quarrels, arguments, contention, but the useful vessel, the unashamed workman, is not to be quarrelsome. You know, I don't preach the Word of God to try to cause dissension or an argument or to try to pick a fight with people. I preach the Word of God really to take the fighting and quarreling off the table. I'm not the one saying a certain thing is a sin or that we should run from certain things or avoid certain types of people. If the Bible says it, then the Lord is saying it. So don't shoot me. I'm just a messenger. I'm going to say what God has said. I'm not making this up on my own. If you don't like the message, your complaint shouldn't be with me. It is with, with God. Don't deliberately be combative. Number six is a humble spirit. Verse 25 says, with gentleness correcting those who are in opposition, if perhaps God may grant them repentance, leading to the knowledge of the truth. You know, we get confused sometimes about the idea of gentleness or meekness. The biblical definition of gentleness is not weakness, but meekness. Meekness is power under control. It's a word that was used in that day in regards to training horses. The tremendous power of the horse that is under the control of his rider is said to be gentle. And so it should be with us. Our message should be under the control of the Lord and given in a spirit of humility. Humility is essential as you try to correct those that are in opposition to the truth. We shouldn't have some air of superiority as if we've earned our salvation because of our piety or because of our works. No, we are sinners saved by grace by God's mercy. That understanding is the basis for our humility in dealing with those who are not saved. But for the grace of God, there I would be, and there I was. That's an attitude of humility, having the heart of a servant, being concerned for others' needs. And then finally, number seven. It seems almost counterintuitive he says, if you want to be a vessel unto honor, you must have a confrontive will. Not to be combative, combative, but you are to have a confrontive will. If you go back to verse 25, with humility, correcting those who are in opposition. You've got to be willing to correct. 
Go over to chapter 4, verse 2. He says it again. He says, reprove, rebuke, exhort. In 1 Timothy 3, he says that the word given by inspiration of God is profitable for instruction and correction. But being humble, being gentle, being loving doesn't mean that you don't tell the truth in regards to sin and rebellion against God. But rather, we speak the truth in love. If we didn't love you, we wouldn't tell you the truth about sin and the wrath of God against sin. But because we love you, we must tell you the truth. But thank God the truth is an antidote to sin. The truth of the gospel is that the righteousness that is required comes through faith in Christ Jesus as a gift of God to the person who recognizes their need for it who recognizes that they are lost, that they are a sinner without hope. To that one who looks to Christ, God gives the gift of righteousness. He credits the righteousness of Jesus Christ to your account by faith. But they could also be applied to a believer who has fallen into some sort of false doctrine or some sin and needs to be confronted with the truth so that by the truth he can come back to his senses and escape the snare of the devil that he's been held captive by. But it doesn't happen without confrontation. By the way, verse 26, when it says, may come to their senses, he's using a verb and a napho, which means to return from drunkenness, to, to sober up. It's, this is the only place it's used in the New Testament. You know, there's all kinds of lies out there floating around in the church. The lies of Satan filtered into Christianity by the dialogue the church wants to have with the culture. These false teachers numb the conscience, deceive the mind, paralyze the will, and cause some believers to fall into a spiritual drunkenness from which they need to be delivered because it is the snare of the devil. And the devil, through those lies, will hold them captive as long as he can and render them useless. So we need to deliver them by confronting them with the truth. We are to be compassionate, loving, and humble. But we don't back off when it comes to the truth. So I would hope that you would want to be an honorable vessel, a workman that needs not to be ashamed. I would hope that you want to be a servant that is useful to the Lord. And if so, you need a biblical fidelity. You need pure fellowship, a clean heart, a discerning mind, a gentle manner, a humble spirit, and a confronted will. I pray that's your desire and the desire of all who truly know the Lord and are called to his service. Lord, we ask that in this time as we finish this message, finish our worship here, that you would use the word of God to dig deep into the hearts of the people here to divide between truth and error, soul and spirit, the thoughts and intentions of the heart, and reveal your truth, the truth of your salvation. Lord, I pray that if anyone here this morning is convicted of their need for salvation, they recognize that they have not received the righteousness of Jesus Christ credited to their account through faith in him, that today would be the day that they would trust in Jesus Christ as their Savior. We ask these things, Lord, in Jesus' name, amen. You know, every year about this time, the single of the Lord reminds me, we're going we're gonna to turn, by the way, to uh, closing song. It's his mercy is more, but I can't remember. No, come thou found of every blessing. Uh, but every, every year as we reach this time of the year, I'm always, the Lord brings to my mind a certain verse of scripture. And it's found in Jeremiah 8:20, And it says, harvest is past, summer has ended, and we are not saved. That's one of the most tragic verses, I think, in the scriptures. And I always think of it this time of the year as the summer comes to a close. You've heard the word of God today. You've heard the invitation to salvation. I urge you today. If you have not 
receive the Lord as your Savior and receive the righteousness which comes through faith in Him. And today would be the day that you would make that right with Him. Let's sing, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. I'd be happy to talk to you today about your salvation if you do not know for sure what your status is, whether or not you have the approval of God. Come talk to me after the service. Let's make that straight today. Come thou fount of every blessing. day.